Our goal for tonight is to introduce the River Learning Center site with a presentation led by the project team of W Architecture and Landscape Architecture. You will also hear about ongoing community engagement and we will provide you with a way to share your preferences and ideas for the site through a public survey. Next slide. As we orient you to the location of the River Learning Center, I want to mention that the City of St. Paul holds a responsibility to acknowledge the historical context of this site. I want to recognize and acknowledge that the land in which we work and live and where this project is located is the traditional and ancestral homeland of the Dakota people. The Dakota and other indigenous peoples, including the Anishinaabe, whose cultural, spiritual, and economic practices hold this land sacred. We recognize them as the original stewards of this land who had thriving and vibrant communities prior to white settlement. By offering this land acknowledgement, we affirm tribal sovereignty and encourage everyone to learn more about the heritage held in the land we occupy. Next, I would like to introduce Council Member Chris Tolbert to share a few words. It's not letting me turn my video on, um, but I can just speak if that's not an option. Um, welcome, everybody. Thank you for um, being here today. It's so great to see so many um, names that I recognize as well as names that I don't recognize, because that means we have new engaged people um, who are interested in this project. I will say that there are very few things that I'm excited about in the city of St. Paul as the potential for the Great River Passage and the River Learning Center. Um, and that's partly because I just love Crosby Park so much. I think it's one of our greatest jewels. I think it's just a fantastic place to be. Um, and the thing that makes me most excited about the potential with the River Learning Center is how much more welcoming we can be um, to the next generation of river lovers and park lovers and nature lovers right here in our own um, city. And I've often said that the best way for us to make sure that we protect the river like um, generations before us have in, in some cases, but is to make sure that the kids of today love and appreciate it as much as many of us on this call do. And I can tell you that I, I take the kids in my family and the neighborhood kids down to Crosby as much as I possibly can. And it's just a fantastic place. I was thinking about some of the words that they've used uh, walking through Crosby Park and the enchanted forest. And I can, I'll be the first to say that those tree roots after a flooding um, are better than any jungle gym than any person could, could think up because it's just a great place for kids to, to crawl on and take energy out on. We've seen eagles hunting fish across the river. We've seen the work of the busy beavers. And um, it's just a wonderful place. And I think the thing that makes me so excited is thinking about the school groups and the community engagement and the parks groups and the young people from all of St. Paul's diverse communities who could come and be welcomed to nature and get comfortable in nature and come back on their own or come back with their families. I know the first time I went to Crosby Park um, as an adult, I got very lost. And that's kind of scary. And I know that's scary for a lot of people, the thought of getting lost in a park. Now, I don't get lost as much anymore, not to say I won't, but um, I think the way that we can um, engage the community and create an inclusive space for people to be at um, is just wonderful. And the potential is just there. So thank you very much for everybody involved. I want to give a special shout out um, to Senator Murphy, Senator Pinto, and others at the state legislature who have been just huge champions of trying to get this, um, the funding that we need to make this um, vision a reality and, and this potential reality. So thank you to both of them. They've been wonderful uh, champions for us. Thank you to the Highland District Council and the neighbors who have continued to be a part of this conversation. I know we've been talking about the potential for the River Learning Center for at least a decade plus now. Um, I wanna thank, um, Mary and, and, and her team, and as well as Anne and all the great parks employees. I see a lot of our great parks advocates and employees on this call. Um, it's great to see everybody. We have just one of, I, I think the best parks and rec team in, in, the, 
in the world. So I just grateful for them and uh, let's make this happen. And thank you everybody for joining us today. Thank you, Council Member Tolbert. I also want to recognize the partnership between the city of St. Paul and the Great River Passage Conservancy. That has made this project possible. Mary DeLay, as Chris mentioned, Council Member Tolbert mentioned, mentioned, is the executive director and joins us tonight, as well as Great River Passage Conservancy board members, Peter Myers and Monica Bryant. I also want to recognize the Prairie Island Tribal Leadership participating in this meeting, as well as the partner organizations and staff of Mississippi Park Connection, Wilderness Inquiry, and National Park Service. Lastly, thank you to the donors who have contributed to this project. Before the project team presents, next slide please. I do want to provide some background of this project. It has been over a decade that this has been talked about as council member Tolbert mentioned. For those who are not familiar with this endeavor, the River Learning Center originated from a master plan process that began uh, within the city and involved partners and community members who worked to create a vision for the 17 miles of the Mississippi River that runs through St. Paul. Listening to the community, the it was called an environmental center at first and became the River Learning Center. Um, it was a top priority identified in a uh, multi-month um, planning process that involved quite a few community members and engagement. This plan was adopted by the City of St. Paul Council uh, in 2013. Next slide. The Great River Passage Initiative was born out of this master plan process with a strategic vision to develop and build the projects identified. The Great River Passage Conservancy was then created in 2018 as the fundraising entity to support site development advancements, build partnerships, identify project resources, and celebrate the significance of St. Paul as the River City capital. Next slide. The River Learning Center is one of three projects underway that the Great River Passage Conservancy is supporting. Each of these projects has a vision to create a new and equitable experience for people along the river to promote care and respect of the environment and to increase commercial and economic vitality within the region. The River Learning Center has the goal to be small scale, light on the land and forward thinking and be a new place for the community to experience this dynamic river landscape. Next slide, please. As, as a city, we rely on partnerships for successful projects of this scale. Other examples include Walk on Teepee, Neighborhood House on the West Side, and other partnered recreation sites. The Great River Passage Conservancy has curated a coalition of partners for the River Learn Learning Center in the planning, fundraising, and advocacy for this project to become a reality. Next slide, please. Key partners and roles are defined for the River Learning Center project are listed here. Each of these groups contribute ideas and vision for the schematic design. From the conversations and the meetings that are underway, the project team will develop the plan for the site and propose structures. The ideas and vision from the community is welcome in this process. And we will introduce additional ways to contribute further, further on in this meeting. Next slide, please. And at long last, I do want to introduce the project team who has been hired by the City of St. Paul and the Great River Passage Conservancy to complete the schematic design for the River Learning Center. We have a talented team of local and out of state professionals working on this project. So I'm going to pass it over to Barbara Wilkes, who is the principal of the W Architecture and Landscape Architecture and the lead for this project team. Thank you, Ann. Uh, we're thrilled to be here. Um, we've been working and looking at the site and meeting with um, some folks, which you'll be hearing about. Uh, but I'm Barbara Wilkes. I'm the leader of the team. 
I'm, I'm just going to point out the people on the picture here to try to keep it short. Jay Wong, who's with us tonight, is our project manager. He will not be speaking though. You will be hearing from James Garrett with Formula here in St. Paul and, and Paula Sanchez, his partner, will be helping with the Q&A. Regina Kennedy um, has been with 106 Group, has been working with us on the community engagement. And Sam Ulbickson is also here tonight and will be talking soon. Um, the rest of the folks are not going to be speaking tonight. Uh, they're a more technical side. Uh, Solution Blue uh, is working with the hydrology. Tim Marshall is helping us with, um, from ETM Associates, helping us with uh, recreation maintenance. And um, Brian Bertrand is helping us with cost estimating. So we look forward to hearing your comments it's going to be so important to us as we move forward. Thank you. So, oh, I, now I will go on to the schedule and you'll see why your comments are very important. Next slide, please. Um, so here we are in the blue. Uh, this is the, the total project schedule. Um, we are now in 2022. This project will be nine to 12 months long. The project though won't open until around 2026. So you see there's a lot of steps and you are here now right at the beginning. And it's, this is the critical time to get community input. I mean, we want it throughout, but getting good, once the project gets set on a certain trajectory, you know, it's harder to turn it. So it's best to get your input in now and make sure that we understand what you would like to see here on the site. Next slide, please. So there'll be several opportunities. Uh, this is now that blue, that uh, nine to 12 months enlarged. So we're in the listen and learn phase. Um, coming up at the end of that, this is our first community meeting. Um, we're then going to go and develop alternatives, alternative plans, which we're going to show to you in June, June 9th, and we want to get your feedback on the kind of alternatives you like and, and what you don't like um, and you know what, what you want to see here. So we'll give you some choices and then we can combine them in different ways after we hear from you. Um, then we will get a final scheme together, a preferred scheme in July, July 21st, and present that to you. And then sometime in the early Fall, we'll have a celebration bringing out the final uh, result after we get your comments on the preferred scheme. So we hope you stick with us throughout this process and we look forward to getting your comments. Thank you very much. Next slide. Oh, um, any questions that um, you want to, there is a website, you can look it up, get some frequently asked questions answered there. And we also will be putting information, you know, as we do these meetings, um, the information will show up on the website. So please um, scan this and, and keep it in mind. Thank you. Sam. Thank you. Um, go to the next slide. So these are Dakota homelands and what's most important is that these are still Dakota homelands. Um, it's important to frame any discussion about building on this site with that recognition, that wherever you are in the Twin Cities or in uh, North America, um, you are sitting on stolen and occupied Dakota homelands. Next. The Dakota are an influential and powerful people with a reach through most of North America, but their presence in history has been diminished and misunderstood. This is an opportunity to recognize their community and other tribal nations as important stewards of the Mississippi River. Next. Dakota people and other indigenous people lived and traveled in interconnected waterways in Bedote, the area uh, of the convergence of these two rivers is an important gathering and ceremonial space where rivers come together as a place of power for Dakota people. And this remains a sacred site to the indigenous community today. Next. 
This is also a place of erased and misunderstood history, but rich with thousands of years of indigenous history. It is now fragmented and the landscape needs both physical and spiritual healing. And this project has the opportunity to be part of that healing. Next. It's important to recognize the Dakota voices that have already provided important insight into building any project at Bedote. Um, some of the insights that the Dakota community leaders, spiritual leaders, cultural leaders, is to just recognize that this is not a park, um, that it, it is shared community space for gathering and that no one owns this land, that this site is part of a connection of sacred sites and waterways. Um, the idea to minimize the footprint of any building here is important. Um, and the identity of the buildings is also critically important, that the buildings should not look like colonist structures, we call them farm or Fort Snelling. And the Dakota, in their care for the landscape, want to make sure that this project goes beyond sustainability, that it's regenerative and restorative, both physically and culturally. Um, also to provide and portray the authentic history of the area, the good, the, the bad, and really most importantly, authentic. Um, Providing areas where private ceremonies and storytelling can happen is part of the healing process. And then to make sure that Native people and all people share in the opportunities created by this project, cultural, economic, and access to the site. Uh, again, these are uh, important Dakota voices that have uh, provided a great insight into this project. And uh, thank you. Thank you, Sam. The River Learning Center is also a part of the Hidden Falls Crosby Farms Regional Park. Next slide, please. This, this, is, this map shows the Hidden Falls Crosby Farm Regional Park. And just to orient you, you know, the Mississippi is the blue flowing under uh, that, the green mass and Shepherd Road is right to the north of the park. Um, the, in the center is the bridge to the airport. The river learning site is also right in the center of this park as with the blue dots around it. This project will help connect the two sides of the park and will provide a gateway to the Mississippi River. Next slide, please. The large green park has five miles of edge to the community and 612 acres. Right now, the vehicular entrances off of Shepherd Road are hard to find. Next slide, please. And for pedestrians and bicycles, access is even more difficult. The Samuel Morgan Regional Trail runs along the northern edge of the site on the bluff, but it's hard to cross Shepherd Road to get to it and it is not universally accessible to get from the top of the bluff down to the river, nor does it look inviting. Next slide, please. The Great, oh, the, the Great River Passage Master Plan recommends improving crossings on Shepherd Road, and we are looking into ways to also make these entries more visible, inviting, and accessible. The River Learning Center is also an urban wilderness. Next slide. As, as Sam mentioned, there is a view across the Bedote from the bluffs. And down below at river level was historically a dynamic floodplain forest. Next slide, please. That changed with the seasons and through the years. A dynamic landscape and habitat for many species, as well as for humans. And you can see here how there even used to be some islands, uh, how those islands in 1950 had merged uh, with the shore and then how they were carved away uh, later. And today um, we have these two um, coves. Next slide. This, this change has resulted in artificial landforms which make it hard to connect across the two sides of the regional park. Um, the floodplain forest covers most of the site, but it has been disturbed by changes to the property, including the addition of these coves. Next slide, please. 
You can see on this map, which shows to the topography, that when they dug out the coves, they just piled uh, the, the soil up in the center between the two, uh, where the pink areas show the land is higher. Next slide, please. This area is also elevated out of the floodplain and anything pink is uh, so, so that we've lost the, the whole floodplain forest in this area. The result of this earthwork are disturbed habitats and landscapes with many non-native plants. Thanks. Next. This is the site. Um, looking at the dashed blue line, um, there's a project boundary that goes down off of Shepherd Road and disembarks in a parking lot there um, at the bottom of Crosby, Crosby Farm Park. Basically, the site connects the city through the bluff, the floodplain, and ultimately down to the river. So those are the three most important geological um, aspects of the site. This is a view from the city transitioning into the bluff. This is a view of Crosby Farm Road. You can see the very small sign um, that is part of the, the street sign. And there's very little marking or reason for anyone to think that there was something awesome um, at the end of that road. This is a view across the Bedote landscape. This is a view of the bluff itself. There's elements of the bluff that are relatively um, untouched or unspoiled. And then there are others that have had significant human um, interaction. This is a look at the floodplain forest trees. This is a view of the existing marina building. This is a view of the river. This is a winter view showing what it looks like frozen. There's a number of existing facilities, including uh, the marina building, the marina warehouse. There's a small pavilion right at the edge of the existing parking. There's also a fence that sort of demarcates the marina area from the rest of the park. There's a boat launch here, fuel station, boat slips, and then there's also a clearing here and there's a number, there's dozens of existing building foundation piles from a, an abandoned project from the 1960s that never, that never took place. But all of that has served to disturb the soil as Barbara had mentioned earlier. From the base of the bluff, when you get down to floodplain level, the site is approximately a quarter of a mile from the bluff. And so you can kind of see within an eighth of a mile, um, you can access a good amount of the site. And within a quarter of a mile, you can access uh, the majority of the site. The River Learning Center is a place for community. The two neighborhoods that this site is adjacent to primarily the Highland neighborhood where the majority of our site is. And then the West 7th neighborhood has a portion that juts out parallel to Crosby Lake. These are extremely diverse communities within a one mile radius. The census group shows that there are many ethnicities 
um, approximately half of this one mile radius is non-white. And if you stretch that out to five miles, you can see that it drops down a little bit, but it's more than a quarter non-white. Some of the feedback that we've heard from the community thus far is that people need to feel like they belong, that the learning center needs a welcoming public gathering space, that the learning center needs a diverse employee base that reflects the people that we want to attract to the site. The learning center needs to feel safe and it needs to be much more visible. So in terms of community engagement, we've hosted several sessions um, with different groups of people, and we've heard a number of different things. We've done our best to identify what the most popular things are. Right now, um, access to the river is really important and community is really important. So how can we connect community to the waterfront? There's a number of other things that we heard. Um, we put out surveys, visual surveys, looking at a number of different ideas for activities and, um, and functionalities that we would like to have at the site. Uh, people really started to respond, um, you can see with the different colored dots, to this notion of having a boardwalk near the river wetland. And they also really responded to public restrooms and having educational and recreational programs. So again, we've had a number of conversations. Um, one of the con uh, conversations that we had in particular was with an African-American black group that we led. Um, many of the things that we wanted to do were get people's ideas on recreation, contemplation, wildlife, um, all different kinds of concepts that people had in terms of how they would describe the river and their relationship to it. So this is the survey. It takes only five minutes. It's online. Tell us what you think and what you want to see here. The possibilities are very, very broad and wide open, and we'd love to hear what you have to say. So please take the online survey by April 30th. We've got another week and a half or so. This is the QR code for it. This is the link for it and there are translations available. These are the next steps. We will have community meeting. Well, we have community meeting uh, number one today. We'll have community meeting number two in June, on June 9th, to look at alternate options, design options that we've come up with collectively with your feedback and input. We'll then have the third community meeting to select a preferred scheme. That will be July 21st. And then ultimately we will have a community celebration which will conclude and celebrate the conclusion of this first very important aspect of the project. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to contact Ann Gardner, our project manager, and her email is below. Thank you. Thank you for coming.
so I think we're going to take questions and answers, uh, questions that have come through the chat, I believe. I guess I can start reading some of them off. Paula? I, I don't, I am not able to see the questions. Oh, okay. There. Hi, um, this is Jay here. I think I can start um, reading the, some of the questions in the chat. Um, for everyone. Um, so this is from Sarita Wilkins. Um, she asked, can you elaborate on what you heard from the community about what it means to feel safe? I can start on that one. And, and also anyone on the team, uh, please, or from the community, please join in. I think there's that it's multiple aspects. Some of it is, not feeling wanted, um, the, that they're not sure if they go down there, what will be down there, and if they're supposed to be down there. Um, I think the marina makes it look, uh, the way it's situated now, makes it look very private. Um, so I think those are some of the aspects that we understand uh, go with that feeling safe. Yes, we yes, we've also um, had some conversation with folks who have noted that at times there are individuals down there that seek to make uh, BIPOC folks feel uncomfortable or feel unwelcome. Um, there seems to be some sense that this space belongs to certain groups of people and that other groups of people, maybe aren't welcome there. And so that's one thing that we wanna address and um, put out there and find some creative solutions to. Thank you both. So another question is like, uh, did, you, did people give reasons why they thought it should be more visible? Uh, it seems it will become too crowded and disturbed. Right. Um, well, I think it, they want it to be more visible so that it's available to a diver, you know to anyone in the city that does want to go there. So it's you know it's a bit of a hidden secret right now. Um, so they, I think the idea of it being more visible means it's actually more public. Um, but I do think I see a lot of comments in the chat about preserving the quietness and you know if we that's the kind of thing we really need to hear from you right now. This is exactly what we want to know if, you know, your concerns and, and how, what are the most important things to you about this place? Um, so please, please continue to um, put forward that position and put it in the survey. You can, there's places you can write in, um, you know, right now, we don't have a plan. So that's, that's why we're asking for uh, comments and um, wanting to hear from you all. So um, please, I'm, please continue. Yeah, and, and I'll also jump in on the visibility aspect. Um, a lot of the conversations that we've had that have mentioned visibility as an issue or a challenge is that people are quite frankly unaware that the park exists. So when you're on the bluff, when you're on the city side, you know, there's about 20,000 people that live within a mile radius of this site. And it's almost invisible to them unless you know that it's there. Um, it's very difficult to identify, to locate, and to even know to follow uh, Crosby Farm Road. So um, whether it be signage, whether it be some type of a monument, whether it be some type of art, whether it be some built element, how can we make the site more visible so that people are aware of its existence and then 
welcomed um, to come down and explore. Right, I see the comment about the bicycle and yes, from the from that, but it's even hard to get across Shepherd Road to get to the bicycle path from the community. So I think that's part of the issue um, here as well. Another question is, are there existing plans to accommodate live board voters? I'm sorry, I didn't hear what kind of... Are there existing are there plans to accommodate live board voters? Apparently it's a person who lived at the Watergate Marina for five years and have many friends that plan to leave there like a long-term. A live aboard, I see. Mm -hmm. Okay. Live aboard, yes. I see. Mm -hmm. um, again, there are no plans for you know, the, the, that's why we're all here. So again, if that's something you think is um, important, please, please put it in the survey. Good signage is definitely important. So another question is where exactly will the river center be at the park? That's, we're going to have the alternatives in June and, you know, we've started a little thinking about it and, you know, there's lots of different possibilities for that. So they, the alternatives we're going to show you once we hear more comments and once we, you know, come up with them and finalize them and in, in June are, are going to show lots of locations. So that's another thing we're really going to need your opinion on, but we don't know yet where they're going to be. Yes, that's the that's the big question. Where is it going to be located? So um, please continue to follow this process. And um, we really appreciate your feedback and your ideas. Um, there's a lot of different possibilities here. And so we want to be able to narrow them down in a way that is going to make sense um, and that people are going to respond positively to. So definitely keep the engagement up for us, please. There's another question about is there's going to be a space for playgrounds? Again, you tell us. That's what we, if you want, you know, again, a playground. I mean, what we're really here tonight, this is the lesson and learn phase, is to understand what you would like to see there. Um, so please, I, if you want to play around, let us know. <laughs> yeah, I think to directly answer the question, yes, there's plenty of room for a playground. Yeah, um, if that's something that folks want to see, if that's a type of amenity that people want, we can definitely find a way to include a playground on the site. There's also a few questions about signage, the importance of signage. Um, any one of you want to talk or be more, uh, speak a little bit about that signage? Well, I know the goal is for this to be a gateway. So I think we, you're absolutely right. We do need more signage. Um, and but, and, and we, we're not going to get down to the design of the signage in this phase, um, but we will, you know, be talking about that there should be a, exactly what you're saying, a system of signage. And, and I think that it, it goes for the city side uh, on top of the bluff, um, some type of signage and, and acknowledgement and recognition um, of this space that it exists that it's welcoming to everyone. But I also think that what we're hearing is that there's not great wayfinding down at the site on the floodplain, um, that there's trails that are hard to find sometimes and, and different things that people would like to access and do if they had a better sense of knowing where, where those things are. And so um, there's an acknowledgement, I think that there needs to be signage on the city side and then also a better wayfinding system 
um, whether that be a combination of signage or color coding things or something um, to help people navigate once they get to the site to find the things that they're looking for. Another question is, is the purpose of the River Center set? No. Um, again, that's, we would like to hear from you all. I think there's a range of identities that could still, you know, come out of your comments in terms of things that you're all talking about, level of activity, um, kinds of activity, et cetera. So please let us, it's not set yet. I will add um, that this, this project, um, it is intended to host space for the National Park Service and Mississippi Park Connection, as well as wilderness inquiry and city operations. Um, so there are some parameters that we are working with as far as um, of, of providing space for these partner groups within this uh, within the area. Um, additionally, we do want to improve access to the river for all people and um, provide a lot of outdoor experiences within this um, within this, this space along the river, a, a natural environment uh, where people can experience nature in, in new and equitable ways. Um, the question about uh, activities and will be biking be considered as part of the activities? Yes. Yes, there's like the, there's biking now on the on the wide pathway. Yes, I think biking is going to be one of the more popular activities uh, from the engagement that we've done thus far. Um, a lot of folks that bike and um, they go from Hidden Falls across to uh, this site, uh, which are actually technically connected and. Biking, I believe, will continue to be um, an activity that is supported and um, considered for this site. I'm noticing a lot of questions about trees being cut down, and um, we, I am, I don't have an exact answer. Our natural resources staff often uh, manages or does manage the the trees in that area as well as um some of our our partner groups so it's often to um, um eliminate some of the invasive species especially ash trees that's um, likely what's happening currently i know there was a, a project recently in hidden falls that did remove quite a few invasive of, of the ash trees that needed to be removed so if there are other questions i can feel free to email me and i can follow up with more details on that There's another question about uh, feeling in, in, that if we are ignoring what the Dakota Awareness Rep shared with us. We're not ignoring that. That is part of the community input that we're getting. Um, again, we're listening right now. So we want to hear all the perspectives, but I think that, you know, obviously is a very important perspective. Um, and Sam is working along with the team to help us, uh, you know, understand it more deeply. Yeah, I can add a little bit to that. So I'm an Ojibwe architect, uh, I'm not Dakota, uh, but I am uh, facilitating the discussion around the importance of uh, honoring Dakota perspectives of the land on this project. The Dakota aren't uh, uh, opposed to development or to providing um, um, spaces down here, um, including the things that we've talked about today. What is going to be important is that their voice is heard throughout this process and that they're included in discussions and that that perspective is honored throughout uh, the planning and design process of this, as are the voices of the other communities that are important to um, to listen to. 
in this uh, important shared space. I saw one question about where the surveys that we showed so far, um, that was from what we, we have a group of committees um, that are also sort of ongoing committees that we're meeting with, um, which includes a technical committee and advisory uh, community committee um, and a partners. So that survey was based on them. It, it is a smaller group. I don't know the total number, um, but yeah, it's not, sur the survey we're putting out now and want you all to participate in, you know, is, is the bigger survey where we hope to really get a lot of information. So um, I hope there's uh, no, no confusion about that. We just wanted, we wanted to show you what, we've, what we have been doing so far, but we really do need this, this public survey information. It's very critical to the process. There is a comment regarding not feeling welcome at the space uh, for newcomers and people who don't relate to big boats, such as at the marina, that can create a first impression that is somewhere between mysterious and not feeling welcome. Uh, is the design going to uh, take that in, in consideration? We, we certainly hope to. We, we definitely have that and understand that it does not look public or open to everyone right now. Yes, um, that's something that we've heard uh, quite a bit and that we've sort of seen with our own eyes. I think uh, the big fence and uh, the privacy uh, or the implied privacy of the existing marina is something that does throw people off and maybe make them feel that they're in the wrong place or that this isn't a, a place that is open for them, which it is, um, it's open for everybody. And so um, our design will definitely take those things into account. And again, um, you know, we're listening and hoping that your, your impact and, and feedback will help guide us towards some design solutions that will give some, some good options to resolve that particular challenge. The marina feels private. Is there any uh, plans to work on the marina? I think that we responded to that question previously. I can, Paula, I can elaborate a little more on the <laughs> marina. Um, sure. Currently, the City of St. Paul Parks and Recreation Department um, manages the tenant there who is now your boat club. They are a new tenant um, who's managing the marina. Um, which just started in the fall. It sounds like some people on the call are very familiar and boat owners and live on the boat. So thank you for being here. Um, as you know, um, so this, this new contract is just starting and they are um, working to bring in their um, business model into this project. I honest, I do not know what the, the exact future is for um, living on a boat. I do know that they have um, they will have more rentable boats so that it is more accessible to people who do not necessarily own a boat um, so that the public can come down and uh, rent a boat at various times. So we are just getting started with that uh, new tenant. They do have some improvements and want to make improvements to the marina site, but some of it is contingent on, on what comes out of this process. So it's a little bit of a, a wait and see at this point, but so far we're glad to have them on board. And I, I'll just add that there's also been an emphasis on human powered crafts as well. So making sure that there's some equity between motorized crafts and folks that are using human powered crafts, kayaks, et cetera. Um, also a question about sustainability and carbon neutral of the project that to take that in consideration. Um. Yes, yes, 
We'll definitely take that into consideration. Um, both my practice formula and Barbara's practice are um, very much leaning into um, sustainability and resiliency. And we will do everything that we can do to make this project as green as possible when we get to that juncture. Um, final question for this from this round it will be lovely for people at Crosby to look across and understand that what they are seeing spot that frames the views across the way. That is a common, uh, yes. Can you change restore the shoreline? Is that an option, a possibility? Um, we, we are looking into some possibilities in that area. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. That will be part of the alternatives when we come back to you in June. I wanted to respond to a question from Michelle. Uh, the question is what outreach has been done to include the input of Dakota people and it must be done at all stages and levels of development. So um, we, we are indeed doing that and working with Sam um, as well as um, the Great River Passage Conservancy uh, board members to um, make sure that we're hearing the input. Sam, do you want to elaborate any further on that? I can do so. Um, there are actually a number of uh, Indigenous-led uh, uh, efforts to um, look at projects along the river, not only in this site, but other sites in the area. And there's been a lot of uh, discussions in the community about how to respectfully build, uh, what to build, what not to build. Uh, again, I'm an Ojibwe architect, not Dakota, but I'm um, deeply involved in the Indigenous community here. and Again, having a lot of great discussions from cultural leaders to uh, executive directors of nonprofits, uh, educators, uh, tribal leaders, to make sure that uh, their perspective is uh, um, heard and that that has some input uh, throughout the life of the project from the initial concepts through the design and construction of the project. So we intend to be part of this project throughout the entire life of it. And, uh, and uh, that is, um, where we're at right now. Thank you. Thank you for the thoughtfulness and the questions too. So I think we're, get, we're getting close to wrapping up here. Um, we'll take maybe one more um, question and then we'll kind of close it out. I think that we are going to unmute a couple persons from the list and I'm going to give the time the space to Andy I'm going to unmute you or ask to mute if you have a question yeah hi how are you hello Andy welcome uh, thank you so much hey so we're everyone's real excited so we're St. Paulites we live right on the river here and we're avid fishermen and we we love boating and we're just really curious I mean you know this is such a unique space but <clears throat> obviously the building is in question. I'm sure you guys aren't real sure where it's going to go or what it's going to be, but of the learning center, how much of that footprint is going to be taken up by National Park Services for their office and how much is actually going to be the learning center? Yeah, um, thanks for the question. Um, I'm not sure exactly um, from a square footage standpoint how much uh, of anything is going to be, um, you know, uh, how the, the space will be distributed, but we do know that they are partners and that they, their offices and um, the, uh, the space for them will be included as part of the, uh, the project, but we're not at all sure yet about, you know, how, what the percentage or the proportion of it will be. I can answer that question too. Um, as James is saying, the, the details and square footage is not determined at this point. And I think that um, the National Park Service will have their headquarters there. They are currently located in downtown St. Paul and leasing a space in uh, 
an urban building that's not very connected to the river. So that is part of this project is um, finding the space for them to be a tenant in this new building. And then in combination with the partner groups, Mississippi Park Connection and Wilderness Inquiry um, and the programming of those, uh, those three entities, as well as the city of St. Paul and additional programming, um, all of that combined is what will create the River Learning Center. So it's a, a multifaceted approach and it's, um, you know, we're still developing the details as far as who goes where and, and how everyone is occupying that space. And that is why we have our design team on board to help figure out those details. I, I wanted to say, it's also not just about the buildings, the learning center. You know, I think it's also about the landscape right? and as a lot of you have been mentioning. Um, so really figuring out how the buildings and the landscape work together, you know, and how we can um, get, get the most uh, learning, you know, learning from the land uh, into the project um, to bring people in contact with, with the, the way the river and the land, you know, really the, the area that we're talking about is part of the river. The river changes heights. So it's anyway, it's, it's a very complicated interaction. And again, I really encourage you all to please stick with us. I know we don't have a lot of answers for you tonight, but we're wanting to hear from you. And then we will come back with alternatives uh, in June for your comments. So, you know, we really appreciate all the stuff we're hearing because that's, it, you know, it, it, that's how we can start making these alternatives to show uh, how to accommodate some of these different ideas. So thank you very much uh, for all your input tonight. But, and please come back and please answer the survey. <laughs> Let's take um, any, any final question. Does anyone else wanna raise a hand before we close out the meeting? I'm not seeing any. So at this time, I'd like to uh, close out the meeting. And I uh, just want to mention again on the schedule that was shown on one of the slides, we anticipate a second community meeting in person um, on June 9th. We're really hopeful that will be in person. The time and details will be determined um, as, as soon as we can and will be posted on the Great River Passage website. I also just wanna thank you for your time this evening, as well as um, the time to respond to the survey. Um, as our team has mentioned, it's very important for us to hear from you and we're excited um, to hear your voices and work that into the process. And lastly, I do have one more plug. We are looking for youth voices um, aged 15 to 20. Um, we are looking for uh, youth to um, be involved in the River Learning Center programming discussions, especially for uh, youth who are um, experience barriers to river access and outdoor programming. If you could please contact me and maybe someone can put my email address in the chat. Um, I uh, would be happy to pass you along or pass those individuals along to be involved in that process. So on that note, I wanna thank our design team for their presentation tonight and the work they've done to date. And I wanna thank all of you for participating and being here with us on this journey. So we're going to close out the meeting and um, we'll talk to you in June if not before. Thank you.